I was told uh, when, I was, when I was a student to always um, that once you write a book that when you do talks, you're supposed to, to share the cover of your book to help uh, ignite uh, your talk uh, about the book. Um, so I want to share the cover from our first book on invisible learning. It was from seven years ago, which wrote with uh, uh, Cristobal Cobo. And so it's in Spanish. It's called Aprendizaje Invisible. And this is the cover that we wanted to do. <laughs> but as you can guess, it was rejected. Um, but we wanted, to, we wanted to have a little fun because we were talking about the industrial model of education and how sometimes it just doesn't work out so well. Um, we also want to point out that oftentimes we're producing packaged brains ready to take on industrial jobs or bureaucratic jobs or jobs that were defined a very long time ago. So hi, again, my name is John, and I would be lying to you if I said this didn't have any value. Um, I went through year after year after year, I eventually got a, a doctorate in education, um, and I'd be lying to you if it didn't have any value. I just think that we can do better, because we do not need packaged brains anymore in this century. So I, I like to say that the future belongs to nerds, geeks, makers, dreamers, and nomads. We don't need those packaged brains anymore. Now, nomads are creative, innovative people who can work at just about any time, anywhere, and with anybody. Nomads contextualize what they know and how, and they solve problems by applying what they know in new contexts. Now, we project by the year 2020 that 45% of the Western workforce will be nomadic. And we see that within contract workers or people taking on multiple jobs or multiple roles. But the key thing to remember here um, is that in the past, jobs and work used to be the same. Your work was the job that you had. But now we're seeing, very, we're seeing a split in this, that work is becoming something that's very personal. Work is something that belongs to you and you alone. My work belongs to me and, and myself alone. And we take on different jobs here and there as we float around, around nomadically, applying our knowledge in new contexts. So many people are already nomadic. And they're focused on personal development, which, which begs the question, what do you want to bring into the world? They're futures oriented. They're looking forward. They're prepared for accelerating technological and economic changes. They're focused on skills, enable mobility, be able to work anytime or anywhere. How can I contextualize what I know to solve new problems? And the key for education is that we need to enable these people to get their work done. We need to think about agency. We need to think about self-efficacy. So here's another way of looking at nomads. Um, they could be anybody at any age. They could be kids. They could be adults. They could be people who are retired. Uh, they thrive in flat networks, working together to solve problems, sharing what they learn, unlearning what they don't need anymore, relearning what they, what they need, and continuously learning. We use new technologies purposively. That is, we're not just using tools just because we think they're cool, but because we've got really cool new uses in mind for them. They contextualize knowledge to solve problems, learn tacitly and explicitly, and most importantly, they're not afraid of failure. Because failing is one of the best ways that we learn. So one of the keys about nomads and nomad society is that we really celebrate how each of us are different. So if nomads need to be different, why do all schools look the same? This is kind of a crisis, isn't it? I mean, look at this picture. I think we all recognize that's a school desk, <laughs> right? This pool chair. And these are sort of universal things because schools pretty much look the same because we're lucky to produce the same people. So who's heard in schools the phrase, now, sit down, shut up, do what you're told, right? I think we've all heard this. We've developed somehow cultures of, of obedience, enforced compliance, complacency, distrust, fear, anxiety. But if we want a nomadic world, we want people with skills that are much more adaptable, people that can really pursue their own passions and empowered to pursue their own passions. We need more flexibility. We need to create mold breakers. We need to accept humility within the system. We need to build confidence within students. We need to bring love into schools. And we need to be courageous as students, 
as teachers, as administrators, and other members of our communities. So here's another way of looking at it. Right? This is a Venn diagram. What happens in school barely touches upon what we need. This means we have to really re reorient our priorities. And we expect kids to fit into these molds. If you're not doing what you're told, if you're not fitting into the parameters of school exactly, then we think that there's something wrong with you. Maybe this means that you need to be medicated even. <laughs> right? But maybe there's nothing wrong with our kids. Maybe that this is something that we're seeing an illness from within the system really emerge. So here's the bottom line. It's all about power. And we need to think about who is deciding what our kids are learning, how our kids are learning, and what the expectations are for kids. Because I'm willing to bet you that most often, the kids aren't having much of a say in that conversation. So I want to present the theory for invisible learning. And that is simply that we learn more, and we do so invisibly, when we separate structures of control that restrict freedom and self-determination from learning experiences. Invisible learning is about reframing structures of control and placing trust in learners and shifting the flow from the top down towards the learner out, becoming much more horizontal in, in our structures and how we do things and how we learn. And this trust piece is really important. And I'll get back to that. So when we look at power, I like to plot it on an axis. We've got a grid here, right? I like to plot it along an axis of agency and self-efficacy. Agency is simply being able to do what you want to do. Self-efficacy is believing in yourself to get done what you want to do. And these things are critical. Now, the goal for education in a nomadic society is to, get, is to work on getting kids to areas of high agency and high self-efficacy, where the goal is where that brain is on that chart, right? That's where we want to be. If we want to create nomadic workers that can work anytime, anywhere, it's just about anybody, that is where our goal should be. But we're not doing that. We're so focused on, con on control. So with the mainstream education, we wind up being occupying this, this area on the, on the, tw towards the bottom of the grid. Right? We deny kids agency as much as we can. We worry about control. We have tests to measure how well kids are, are falling, falling into this. But sometimes kids are able to learn despite their education and develop a sense of self-efficacy. So we see a bit of a shift in the upward slant there. Now, this isn't all negative. I think that there's tremendous hope here. Now, invisible learning embraces the paradigm or embraces the spectrum of learning from formal, non-formal, informal, and serendipitous learning. Sometimes we just do it, right? Sometimes formal education doesn't work. Here in Colombia, salsa dancing, learning to how to dance salsa, is compulsory in primary education, right? I think it's fantastic, but not every kid learns salsa, right? So who's then responsible for teaching the kids salsa? What happens? The kids learn it at home. The family takes over. Aunts and uncles come over and teach the kids salsa, right? These are less formal ways of learning. And why does this work? Because it is okay to fail at home. That's tremendous. So how much do we learn that's invisible in our lives versus visible? We really don't know, and it's really hard to measure this stuff. Uh, John Seeley Brown, about a decade ago, estimated that the ratio is about five to one. That is, for every six things that we learn, um, only one of them is through formal education. Everything else is done informally, non-formally, or serendipitously. So what do you want to do? What are other ways? Unschooling is a, an area that has really emerged over the, over the last few years. And this is a mode where kids just simply leave school to learn on their own. 
leaving the structure of control from the school, leaving the structure of somebody telling them what, how to learn from the school, and creating their own personal learning environments, their own personal learning networks. And that's really hard to do. Another idea that's really, that's really starting to blossom is democratic schools. Think of these as, as group unschooling, right? These are schools where, by, by their very mission, kids have an equal say and also an equal uh, responsibility in how their schools are run. And they help to get towards this area of high agency and high self-efficacy because their very mission is from the onset providing for that agency. So here's some uh, images from democratic schools uh, in Europe. Uh, these are from, from France. One of the key elements that really emerge when kids decide what they want to learn and when they want to learn is that oftentimes they want to engage in play. Play is a very natural way for, for humans to learn. It's one of the most basic ways that kids learn. And so you can see in the school, they don't have um, tables and desks like you find in a normal environment. They got space to play. And kids learn how to create rules together. They learn social skills together. They learn how to collaborate together. And it's phenomenal. Shared governance. If you want to take school seriously, and you want all kids to take school seriously, they need to have an equal say in how the school is run. And so here's a, here's a judicial council meeting taking place in, in France. And think about it. If every kid had an equal say on how a school is run, including the finances, who gets hired, who gets fired, and we're not just talking about picking lunches or, or deciding what the colors of the walls should be, that's a really big thing. It's not about having the freedom, but it's also the responsibility to make, to make the right decisions for the community. Mixed ages. You'd be hard-pressed to find research that shows that seven-year-olds should only learn with seven-year-olds or eight-year-olds should only learn with eight-year-olds in the same way that it'd be hard to find that 41-year-olds like me would work best with only 41-year-olds, right? Kids are always teaching each other. Older kids have experiences and things that they can share with younger kids and vice versa as well. And finally, building cultures of trust. And this is so important because we've driven trust out of so much of what we've been doing within school that if we build schools that trust and freedom, responsibility are, are part of their blood, we start to see phenomenal things happen. So to wrap up here, the theory for invisible learning is about attending to this problem that we have within power and enabling kids to find their own way, bringing in trust. Invisible learning is a theory for self-determination. It's a theory for freedom. It's a theory for building flexibility. It's a theory for building confidence. It's a theory for creating mold breakers within schools, not conformists. It's a theory for bringing in love. It's a theory for bringing in humility. And it's a theory for bringing in courage. So I just want to wrap up with this quote from Albert Einstein. He says, I never teach my pupils. I only attempt to provide the conditions in which they can learn. And I think that's a beautiful way to start. By bringing the trust, by bringing the love, and creating the conditions for kids to make responsible decisions and learn on their own. Thank you.